I'm Jay Elias, the General Legal Counsel at Dyer Lake Funeral Home in North Attleboro. Welcome to this episode of Live and Learn, a series of programs designed to be informative, educational, and upbeat, and always intended to enhance and encourage our personal wellness and awareness. This episode is called The Blink of an Eye. As with every episode, I hope you'll learn some new and interesting facts that you may never have known. After all these months, when many of us have had ample time for personal introspection, self-analysis, and pondering the mysteries of our life, you probably think you know your body pretty well. Even so, there may be a few things that you never knew or ever considered. And so let's start with the blink of an eye. We blink when we temporarily close both eyes at the same time. Most of us actually blink about 12 times every minute, and each blink typically lasts about a third of a second. When you do the math, that's more than 5,000 blinks in a day, assuming you stay awake for eight hours a day. And when you add it up, that's more than two million blinks a year. But why do we blink? Well, it seems the primary reason is to maintain the integrity of our eye's surface. Blinking lubricates our eyes. It helps to shield our eyes from foreign objects like dirt and dust and from continuous exposure to light. And it actually helps to relieve eye fatigue by allowing the eye muscles to momentarily rest and reorganize, even for that split second. Blinking can be spontaneous. For example, when we blink without thinking about it, or it can be voluntary when we intentionally choose to blink. Or it can be reflexive when it's triggered by sudden impulse or a loud sound or a strong light. The number of times we blink decreases significantly when we're focused on something. So on average, instead of blinking 12 times a minute, we're likely to only blink three to eight times a minute when we're focused on reading or watching TV or listening to music, working on a computer or participating in some activity that requires us to concentrate. And intense concentration also tends to reduce the blink rate. If you think about it, that makes sense. For example, if you're in a situation that implies danger, your blinking rate will undoubtedly decrease significantly. And that's to help you look around quickly without missing things by having your eyes closed. On the other hand, stress and anxiety tend to increase our blink rate. It also probably comes as no surprise to learn that when a group of people are watching the same movie, TV show, or video, they also tend to blink at about the same time. A wink, on the other hand, is when we blink with only one eye. Unlike blinking, winking is actually a form of body language and nonverbal communication. But as most of us can attest, the wink of an eye can be an inherently ambiguous gesture. It can be a little unsettling sometimes. Unlike when we nod our head or make a thumbs up gesture, which have well accepted meanings, when we give a wink, it can mean different things to different people. A wink can have a flirtatious connotation or maybe it implies a shared private joke. It generally communicates a kind of familiarity, affiliation, or rapport In one interesting study that looked at just how many meanings a wink can convey, a research team asked a male and a female actor to approach individuals who were waiting in public areas. They knew nothing about it. The actors then asked people the time of day, waited for a response, said thanks, then winked once and walked away. What the researchers do? They asked the individuals who had been winked at to complete a very simple questionnaire evaluating the winker. Were the winkers liked? Well, generally, yes. 
but only when the winker was of the opposite sex. And that finding was consistent with the sense that there's a little bit of flirting going on when we wink. Most revealing was the data from a more open-ended question about what the wink meant. The overwhelming majority of people who were winked at thought it conveyed thanks or appreciation. Many felt it reflected friendliness or niceness. Some attributed the weak wink to a sign of flirtatiousness or attraction. And about 20% of the people who had been winked at couldn't quite figure out why they were being winked at. And they attributed to that, that wink to either an eye problem, a twitch, a sense of insecurity, or some ulterior motive. By the way, uh, the wink of an eye isn't alone in nonverbal ambiguity. If you think about it, many nonverbal cues can mean different things to different people. Most of us think a smile means we're happy, but a smile can indicate not only happiness, but smug condensation or even pain. Furrowing your eyebrow can communicate anger, confusion, or concentration. The bottom line is that most of these kinds of nonverbal communication, like the wink, really do need to be interpreted in their context and often by culture. For example, in certain Commonwealth countries, the United Kingdom, Ireland, Australia, an outward-facing V sign is seen not as a sign of peace, but as something of an obscene gesture equivalent to our giving the middle finger. Oops. Did you know that excessive blinking, or in the extreme, not blinking at all, can be a telltale sign of a liar? Well, here are a few other nonverbal communications and signs that may suggest that someone is fibbing. Do they stare intensely at you without blinking, making you a little uncomfortable? Some people try to show their intent on maintaining constant eye contact with you as they try to control you and the conversation. Do you remember Bernie Madoff, one of the most famous Wall Street con men in recent memory? Well, he was well known for staring intensely at and through people without blinking. But most of us, when we're in conversation, we tend to occasionally blink. We may even look away from time to time when we're talking with someone. Does someone quickly and abruptly change their position when talking to you? If someone makes sudden and abrupt head moment, uh, movements when you ask them a direct question, they may be lying to you about something. Whether it's when they jerk their head back or tilt it to the side, right before they're expected to respond to a question, you might want to pause and consider the truthfulness of the response that's coming. Does it seem that the individual's breathing pattern changes? When someone is lying to you, they may begin to breathe differently. It can be a reflex action. If their breathing changes, their shoulders rise, their voice grows a bit shallow and wispy, it may be that they're out of breath because their heart rate and blood flow change. Our bodies often experience these kinds of changes not just when we're lying, but when we're nervous, anxious, or feeling tense as well. Does the individual tend to repeat their words or phrases? Well, this may happen because they're trying to convince you and themselves of something. They're trying to validate the lie in their mind and in yours, and the repetition is a way to buy them a little more time as they attempt to gather their thoughts. When someone isn't being honest and you ask follow-up questions, they often try to stall before responding, perhaps trying to think of what to say next. The person who's lying may instinctively cover vulnerable body parts, such as their throat, their chest, their neck, head, or abdomen, and very often may cover their mouth with one hand. Putting a hand over their mouth suggests that someone may not want to deal with an issue or answer a question, and they're quite literally trying to close the conversation. On the other extreme, 
the liar may provide way too much information. When someone goes on and on and gives you too much information, information that's not requested and with an excess of detail, there's a good chance they're not telling you the whole truth. Liars often tend to talk a lot because they're hoping that with all their talking, others will believe them. They'll also tend to turn the table on you and literally point away from themselves. When someone is hiding the truth, they become defensive. They try to turn the table on you, and in doing so, there may be a lot of finger pointing at you and away from themselves. And we all know this one. Liars tend to begin to perspire right in front of your very eyes. When people lie, it's understandable that they tend to get nervous and uncomfortable, and then they perspire. So look for that telltale bead of sweat over their upper lip or on their forehead, or just the fact that they're constantly doing this when they're talking to you. The sweating, it happens because their autonomous nervous system is working overtime. Another sign of a potential liar is when they start to really fidget. Fidgeting can be a sign that someone's filled with nervous energy and may not be such a good liar. It seems that good liars are better able to keep their nerves in check. So let's switch gears a little bit. Here's a question for you. Why are most of us ticklish and why can't you tickle yourself? Well, the answer seems to be, one, that beneath your skin lay millions of tiny nerve endings that alert your brain to all types of touch, as well as exposure to things like heat and cold. It's this sense that allows us to keep from burning our hand if we put it on a hot stove. When these nerve endings are lightly stimulated by being touched, they send a message through your nervous system to your brain, which analyzes the message. For a long time, people believed that humor and tickling were somehow inextricably intertwined. After all, it seemed that if tickling didn't help develop good humor, then why would we laugh when we're being tickled? The famous Charles Darwin surmised that humor and tickling are closely related because both require a good mood to be effective. Although Darwin contributed significant knowledge to science and evolutionary understanding during his lifetime, it seems he may have missed the mark with this hypothesis because as it turns out, humor and tickling really are not related. Think back, we've all been tickled when we're in a bad mood and continue to be in a bad mood after being tickled. Actually, sometimes our bad mood even worsened. Some evolutionary biologists and neuroscientists have explained, somewhat, why they think we laugh when we're tickled. It's been suggested that we're actually displaying a kind of submission to an aggressor, that is, the person who's tickling us. And the parts of our body most ticklish happen to be the same ones that are most vulnerable to injury. And laughing when, be tick when being tickled may have been a way our very distant ancestors sent a message to someone stronger than them, the aggressor, that they weren't a threat and didn't want to engage in a fight. So why can't we tickle ourselves? Well, the answer to that may be as simple as our anticipation of the event and a reflection of our subconscious awareness that this very predictable touch from our own fingers isn't worth our attention. Speaking of laughter, it does seem that laughter is part of our universal human vocabulary. Unlike the wink of an eye or hand gestures, all of us seem to share the understanding of laughter. Unlike English or French or other languages, we don't have to learn to speak it. We're all born with the capacity to laugh. And laughter pretty much occurs unconsciously. We really don't consciously choose to laugh, although we can strive to consciously inhibit laughing. The best we can do is often 
pretend to laugh or force laughter, but it's neither real or genuine, and it's very hard to laugh on command. We also know that laughter is a message sent to others, and it's highly contagious. We even laugh at the sound of laughter itself. Let's switch gears again and talk a little bit about those goosebumps that we've all had and what causes them. So here's the scene. You've been swimming in the pool or the ocean on a breezy summer day. The water may be warm, but the wind's a bit strong, and the moment you leave the water, you feel a chill and instantly experience goosebumps. Here's an entirely different scenario. You hear a touching song from years ago that was a favorite of a loved one who's no longer with us, and you get goosebumps and chills just listening to the music. Or a friend tells you an eerie story that instantly triggers a memory. And there they are, goosebumps. So how is it that such seemingly unrelated events elicit the very same body reaction? Well, once again, it seems that evolution and our distant ancestors are at play here. Goosebumps, those tiny elevations of our skin that resemble the skin of poultry after the feathers have been plucked. Not really a pretty picture. Those bumps are caused by contractions of tiny muscles. Each contracting muscle creates a shallow depression on the skin surface, which causes the surrounding area to protrude and the hair to stand straight up. That's what a goose bump is. When prehistoric man was cold, this rising of hair expanded the layer of air that served as the body's insulation, thereby retaining heat. Even though most of us don't have a hair coat like our evolutionary ancestors did, creating something of a down coat for us, goosebumps continue to persist thanks to the subconscious release of a stress hormone that we know as adrenaline. And adrenaline not only causes the contraction of our skin muscles, but also influences other body reactions. It's released when we feel cold or afraid, when we're under stress, when we feel strong emotion, excitement, anger, even sadness. And that's what causes goosebumps. And have you ever blushed I think we've all blushed at various times in our lives. You may have blushed when you were embarrassed, humiliated, discouraged, or ashamed. Whatever the reason, blushing is most often associated with our reaction to a heightened self-consciousness. Blushing occurs when an emotional trigger causes the release of adrenaline again which in turn causes the tiny little capillaries that carry blood to your skin to widen. Since blood is then brought closer to the surface of the skin, it causes you to have a pinkish tint or a blush. But why is it that embarrassment triggers the fight or flight release of this hormone adrenaline, which in turn causes blushing? Well, it seems many psychologists believe that blushing is a defense mechanism, again, like laughing when we're tickled. But what possible survivor, survival benefit is there to blushing? Well, it's been suggested that through blushing, others will see your discomfort. They'll immediately recognize it as a show of your sincere regret or shame. In doing so, blushing thereby promotes trust and positive judgment by observers. In other words, if you show embarrassment by blushing at your aggressor, then you're more prone to be liked, forgiven, and trusted than those who appear defensive, who don't show similar regret, and are seen as a threat. So, let's talk about the power of our human nose. For a very long time, scientists believed 
humans were not particularly good at detecting and identifying odors. That was best left for dogs and other animals. It turns out, though, that humans seem to have powerful smell potential indeed. One study from 2014, for example, concluded that people may actually be able to distinguish as many as one trillion different odors. That's a million million. Unfortunately, our language doesn't have words for a trillion smells, and much of smelling happens sort of under the radar of our consciousness. And here's something to consider. Each of us has our own unique scent. I'm not referring to the perfume or cologne you wear or the deodorant you use. Your body has its own signature odor, just as your fingers and actually your tongue have their own unique prints. And that O de you remains, even if you change your diet. It's referred to as your odor type. It's also long been known that sense and smell are extraordinarily potent cues for evoking our personal autographical memories. I should say autobiographical memories. You smell chlorine, and without a moment's thought, you're taken back to summers spent in a neighborhood swimming pool. A whiff of apple pie, fresh, freshly baked chocolate chip cookie, or the scent of a certain perfume that maybe your mother wore, and you're instantly transported to your childhood home. How many of us can vividly recall the smell of a brand new box of crayons? And that instantly takes you back to your second grade classroom. Well, it seems that our noses have a way of sniffing out nostalgia. How is it that such strong emotions and vivid memories can be instantly triggered by one simple sensory cue, the smell of something? Short answer seems to be that the regions of our brain that juggle smells, memories, and emotions are very much intertwined. In fact, the way that your sense of smell is wired to your brain is unique among all of your senses. And interestingly, the emotional power of smell isn't lost on business either. In the 1950s, for example, following World War II, the film industry was facing new competition from television, which was rapidly gaining popularity in the U.S. and around the world. And so in 1959, something called Aroma-Rama was introduced to movie theaters. It was described as a new cutting-edge technology that would forever change how we watched movies. Aroma-Rama. It was dispersed throughout the theater through its air conditioning system. And the first movie that used it was called Behind the Great Wall. I'm not certain, but that may have also been the last time it was used, both in the movies and in any other context. Interestingly, just weeks later, there was the introduction of another technology called smell vision in the theater. And it was used during a film titled Scent of Mystery. And instead of employing the theater's ventilation system to disperse the, cell, the smells, smell vision pumped smells out of a series of vents beneath the theater goers' seats. But again, given the fact that few, if any of you, remember smell vision either, it'd be safe to conclude that smell vision didn't quite live up to its hype either. But to show you that businesses to this day continue to have faith in that smell-emotion connection, the North American perfume market alone has an annual value of about $8 billion. That's with a B. And there's one perfume company called Zyrena, that's with an X, that has sought to capitalize on the scent memory and scent emotion connection that are so strong. A few years ago, it introduced a line of fragrances called virtual reality. And some of the scents and some of the colognes 
included familiar yet unexpected scents, including the smell of a theme park, a cologne that smelled like a gas station, and of course the smell of brand spanking new sneakers called Factory Fresh Cologne. The company says that that scent can be used as both a traditional cologne to smell like a new pair of sneakers and a, quote, renewal spray to bring an old pair of sneakers back to its fresh out of the box glory days. It's made up of notes of rubber sole, glue, leather, and textile. And for that factory made, fresh out of the box, never been used plastic scent you're longing to wear, think new car, Zyrena also sells its plastic by Trixie Mattel scent. And then there's Cheetos and new baby scent. And as the father of four children, I'm not sure I can pinpoint exactly what the smell of new baby is. Sometimes good, sometimes not so much. There's also Burger King perfumes and McDonald's scented candles. And yes, these are all for real. A few final thoughts about our unique sense of smell. We've often heard the expression, wake up and smell the coffee. While it appears that sound can disrupt our sleep and awaken us, think alarm clock, scents generally cannot. In fact, studies at nearby Brown University indicate that we should not, for example, rely on our sense of smell to awaken us to the danger of fire. It's unlikely that we'll smell the smoke. It seems that study participants easily detected odors when awake and in the very early stages of sleep, but once they were deeply asleep, odors could not be detected. And so one of the study's authors noted, as the saying goes, we wake up and smell the coffee, not the other way around. So while you may think you woke up thanks to the smell of coffee, in reality, you woke up and the first thing you noticed was the smell of coffee. I'm Jay Elias. Thank you for watching this episode of Live and Learn. I look forward to your joining me again for another program designed to enhance your wellness and awareness. And until then, remember, it's never too late to learn and life goes by in the blink of an eye. So let's appreciate the moments.